Welcome to Open Minds. Uh, in the studio with us today are Mark and Ed from the Open Minds group and Donna, who's here as our guest today, is a paranormal investigator. In this episode, we're talking about life after death. So I'm going to open with a question. Is there life after death or is there life after life? Ed. Yes. <laughs> That's such a great question, um, but such a difficult one to answer because, um, you know, you expect us to give our beliefs on this because I don't think I can prove either way. I think I can show, demonstrate to anyone's satisfaction that what I say is or is not. So I'll simply give my belief. I'm pretty certain that there is something beyond what this is. I don't think that we are annihilated when we die. I, I believe that there's something in us that moves on and perhaps even comes back. So I think life after life probably is true. Um, I still haven't figured out why we don't remember having been here before, but we're going to no doubt talk about that. So, you know, what we call death, we talk about death as like a rite of passage, really, in that view. I, I from, think from one form of yeah, life to belief, another form of life. My belief, and I share it with, the, with, with other people too, my belief is that we come here um, with a mission and um, we don't understand what that mission is when we're here in this form and we try to go through that and we go when we've either concluded the mission or we need to try again. It's very Hollywood, I think. <laughs> Mark, where are you on this stuff? No, it's a difficult one. I, my, my mind's constantly, you know, kind of being changed. Um, I mean, the problem is, is that any ideas around it are only belief. You know, a lot of people have hope that you know, there is something beyond the grave. And I often wonder whether or not that has kind of generated this whole idea of an afterlife, heaven and hell. And, and it's the hope that we're not, like you just said, annihilated mm. when we die. Uh, I'm very interested in, though, uh, consciousness. And there are reports where consciousness can exist outside the body, where people have had that sense of not being here inside themselves, but their consciousness has been elsewhere. I mean, people talk about, don't they? Uh, yeah, we're going to we're gonna talk about yes, I know, yeah, later, but yeah. people talk about being in a different place as they're dying and, or, or in a different or place. Or not necessarily it. when people are dying, people have, you know, you know, being on the operating table and that type of thing. And that interests me. And I think to myself, well, if, if the consciousness can exist outside the body, even if it's only for, for moments, you know, then maybe there is a possibility that when we die that consciousness may also continue to exist in you know kind of some form after we've died okay donna um life after death where are you, where are you with this um for me uh i think the term is the life after death um i, I would say there is consciousness after death consciousness lives on I so think. you're with mark with, i'm this. with mark and from the experimentation and the research that we've done and the communication that we've had from, quote, the other side, I firmly believe that consciousness um, carries on after death. From personal experience and from, as I say, investigation and, and research. So in this respect, you know, what, what is consciousness then? Um, what, what are you talking about? I, th I think for me, the, the fact that, you know, we all want to know, do we survive death as a physical process? I see it sort of like the butterfly and the chrysalis. It's just, in a, in a way, like what I'd say, it's just a transformation from one form to another. But when I talk about communication, um, having worked with various mediums and um, in, investigated mediumship and actually physically communicated with something that I can't see, but I can hear, and had a one-to-one -one conversation, those are the type of... Um, that's the type of consciousness that I'm talking about, where I can communicate with an entity or a voice or a spirit that is somewhere else. Okay, now we use a lot of terms, don't we, around this subject. You know, Mark has already said, you know, maybe there's a sense in which people want for there to be something else mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and want this not to be the end, you know, all there is. We use a lot of terms like we use afterlife, <coughs> we talk about heaven and hell, 
uh, the hereafter, the spirit world, the other side. Nobody um, knows. Um, these are just uh, attempts to explain. It's terminology, I think. It's mm. terminology to explain the unexplainable. And also, I mean, you know, a lot of, you know, kind of our ideas around things like heaven and hell are from people's imaginations. You know, I mean, in, in the the Middle Ages, uh, people were constantly painting scenes of heaven and hell. There seemed to be this preoccupation with what it would be like in hell or what it would be like to, to be in heaven. And, you know, many, many paintings uh, have been inspired by that subject matter. So therefore that's imprinted itself on us as, I suppose to a certain degree for some people, being a physical place, you know, a, a place. And of course in those days there was this view that the universe was layered in a sense, that, you know, above us was a, a kind of layer. There was a layer of the sky and above that layer was the heavens. Mm. Uh, and then below us was another layer with, was, was kind of hell or the, yeah. the, I think, I think the me, nether worlds. The most yes. important thing is, um, okay, this, this is what I do now. I investigate and research. But actually, I had no interest in this subject matter until uh, an incident when my brother-in-law was killed in a road traffic accident. And four days after he was killed, his voice imprinted on my telephone answering machine. So I... You know, it comes as quite a shock when you hear a dead man's voice timed and dated on your telephone answering machine. And I tried every rational explanation. I phoned BT, I spoke to the engineers, I said, there's something wrong with my system. And he, the guy is like totally perplexed. What are you talking about? Can you explain this? And I said, right, the time and the date must be wrong on my telephone answering it's not a machine as such, we used to have tape machines, it's built in, it's a, a network, it's mm. digital. And um, he said that would be impossible because uh, we're connected to the uh, atomic clock, Greenwich Mean Time clock. We'd have to have a system failure and, you know, and I really wanted someone to tell me how my brother in law's voice had what came on to my phone. Hello, it's Neil, is Donna there? Well, the interesting thing about that phone call was I hadn't been home after he was killed. I stayed with my sister for two weeks and um, basically got home, was going through all the uh, messages and about the fourth or fifth one in, there was like <laughs> lots of static electricity, clearly his voice, lots more static electricity like on the line. And then a female's voice who actually said, hello, are you there? Can you hear me? And that really perturbed me because obviously he hadn't phoned up from the other side. His voice had somehow come in on that call. And this female, who later turned out to be my daughter's midwife, my daughter was having a first child, had actually physically heard the voice too. So the BT engineer, and this is going to sound really bizarre, um, asked me, why are you so insistent that the time and the date is wrong? And I said, because the guy who left the message is dead. And he went very quiet. Mm -hmm. And then he says to me, um, well, he said, this is not the first time I've heard about this phenomena. And in fact, if you go and Google it, he said, I think you'll be surprised. And I did go and Google it. And ever since we've had telecommunications, not just in modern day society, but there was a book written about telephone calls from the dead in the 1930s. So this is not a new phenomena. And the telephone was quite new then. Of mm -hmm. course it was, yeah. yeah and it yeah. certainly wasn't what we have today. And then I realised that right across the scale, there was people who were getting phone calls supposedly from deceased relatives so that's what started my journey it wasn't an interest I was avidly it was a progression yeah. so I have no explanation for that I mean that's interesting because you know Ed was saying there's no evidence there's a lot of evidence but that sounds like evidence to me mm -hmm. well, you know, evidence I, I, for you? I, I'm gonna just be devil's advocate yeah you know because I do believe this stuff yeah um, but let me be devil's advocate because it's worth challenging that of course. let me suggest that it could be your imagination mm -hmm. because you were certainly stressed at the time in ways that you probably wouldn't even remember being mm -hmm. stressed. Um, so you could have had that imagination. You said that someone else heard it. Yeah. You could have been projecting that to what you thought she said to you. So your imagination is a very powerful thing. And so a skeptic might yeah, say, you know, it's not explained by what you've said. It could be just imagination. I think, I think what you say is, I agree. I was very skeptical of what I was hearing. So what I actually did, because bear in mind that this is recorded onto my system. 
so the message is there for all to hear. So obviously I couldn't play it to my sister because she'd only just lost her husband. Mm -hmm. I brought in my partner and my mum and sat them down and I said, I'm going to play you something now. Can you please listen to it and tell me what you hear? And both of them said, that's Neil's voice. Have it. Yes, I do. And was this before you became a paranormal yes, investigator? Yes, this was. This, this was the thing that got you into it. This is it, the it? thing yeah. that got yeah. me into it. Yeah. This this phenomena um, is is <sighs> there's a form of research called uh, ITC instr instrumental transcommunication, and that is uh, communication through electronic means, and it's happening with computers. It's happening with mobile phones. It's happening communication from, the other side. from the other side, wherever the other side is. Or and what, whatever it is. And whatever it is. And, you know, me and Mark have had some great um, discussions about the origin of these voices. And the thing is, you don't need to be in a haunted house to record these voices. You don't need to be anywhere where there's record. You can do it in your own home. You can leave a voice recorder running, leave the house and come back and find and these voices interact with us. The skeptic's view is that it's random radio pickup. It's okay. all of it is, you know, it's uh, apnea, it's auditory paradelia, all of those things. But when you hear a voice interacting with you, when you hear a voice coming through the speaker of a radio in broad daylight, which recently happened to me in broad daylight in Liverpool, right next to Anfield, and I recorded it because I was in the beauticians. I'm going to have to stop you there yeah. because we're going to our break. Yeah. Uh, when we come back, um, we're going to move on a bit and yeah. we're going to talk about um, uh, punishment in the after, the notion of punishment okay. uh, or even reward in the afterlife, uh, judgment and so on. So look forward to that after the break. Welcome back to Open Minds. Uh, we're in the studio with Mark and Ed and Donna. We're talking about life after death in this episode. Um, actually, in the break there, one of the production team uh, was telling me that there's some, you may know about this, Donna, there's some evidence where um, when they weigh somebody, I think this is right, yes. when they weigh somebody um, after they've died, there, there is a, there's a, so many grams of yeah. weight that's kind of seven ounces that's or missing like this. you know yeah. what do we know like mark tiny, you, yeah. you you knew about this well I, I don't know too much about it but like you've just said that they've they've weighed a body just before and just after death and they've taken into consideration all sorts of factors, factors yeah, like you know sure. hydration the loss of bodily fluids and everything and when they take those factors into consideration and, and rule them out. There's still this. You said a seven. Is it seven? I think. I think it's I think like it grams. Grams. It's so many grams. grams. Yeah. Difference. The the body is seven grams lighter. Or seven ounces. Something. Uh, like seven. It. Some measure lighter after death, and so therefore people are obviously. So there's so that that would indicate perhaps that there's some there's something that we have about us which is can be physically measured, they, even which they which, did physically measure it. They actually had. Um, uh, special mattresses in hospices, family members were, gave permission to the scientists who were doing the research to allow their loved ones to be lying on these mattresses and they, the measuring was so accurate that's how come they knew that everyone had this and the, you know they're saying and is it all I mean just out of interest because I've only heard this you know yeah. of, of people but is it always the same yes it's always the same and, and always the same and what's the conclusion what you know what was something the... leaves body what <laughs> oh. I, I'm going to be sceptical yeah. again. You surprise me. If I may. <laughs> but, but as the engineer in me, I, I've got this left-right-hand conflict going oh, on in my head all the time. But the engineer in me is saying, that's baloney. If you actually have a spirit, which we kind of like to think is an energy force, yeah. then okay, all matter is energy in some form. But seven grams of it, that's a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. That's a huge amount of energy. Why would we need that much? You know, why, why is that such a huge amount of energy? Seven grams, if you, if, well, seven grams of matter is, is a huge amount of energy. Talk to any, nu any, any um, nuclear physicist and they will tell you all about why that's a huge amount of energy. I would have imagined that it would be immeasurable if there's a spirit leaving the body, a consciousness leaving. I'd have, think, I'd have thought it would be 
Hang on, hang on a minute. I must intercede there because okay. it's just, just come through my ear from, from the, again from the production team, oh, right. wonderful people that oh, they great. are. 21 grams. Uh, there you go. That's, that's far exactly too many more. grams. Far too many grams. We just jump into a conclusion here. We were yeah. saying, yeah. I mean, the actual vernacular you, you, you used then was something leaves the body. Or we, yeah. oh, the only conclusion, you use that. The only conclusion we can come to really is that there is a difference before and after uh, a person has died yeah. of 21 grams. We're not necessarily, we, we, we can't now say that is the spirit or no. that is something leaving the body. All we know is that it's, it's not grams. body fluid, it's not um, waste, it's not so the breath, it? the, it's something else. But we can't say it's a spirit. No, once, once again, it's unexplainable. Right. So I suppose really but that's I, as far I, as we are on that subject. I can remember when my mother died. Um, I was with her when she was in hospital when she died. And... Um, <clears throat> And the nurse said, uh, would you like to have a few moments with your mother? And she's passed away. And I said, yes. And then she came in and it may be something they do. I don't know. And she said, would you like a cup of tea? And she ushered me out for a cup of tea. And then she said, would you like to say goodbye? And when I went, when I was sat with my mother just after she died the first, for the first time, I could still sense her there. I had a sense of a presence in the room. When I went back in after my cup of tea, Nothing. there was just, you know, mm -hmm. a, a, an element body. That's my yeah. feeling as well. When my mum died, I, I, I was there both before and after, and, and I, I just couldn't sense she wasn't there anymore. Once, she, once she'd gone, she was no longer there. She was, she, well, once she'd gone for a few minutes, she yeah. was no longer there. I couldn't feel it at all. But that could, that could simply be my emotion was adjusting to this immense loss uh, of, some, of a human being. And, and, and to feel that they're there still when they've just gone, I don't think that's unusual or inexplicable. And then to feel that they've gone when you've had the, the moments to adjust to that. I mean, watching someone physically die, which is something that I've done a number of times, is it's the visual aspect for me. It, not because of my beliefs, because some of the people that I witnessed who died was way before that I got involved in any of this. But there seemed to be almost something like, almost like it just left the body, like life itself, mm, the yeah, essence yeah, of yeah, life, yeah. left the body in, in a really peculiar manner. And I have looked at, um, you know, deceased relatives and it's almost, it's so weird. It's almost like they are a casket, a shell, a pupa or something. There's, That's how I felt. There's nothing there. I remember saying to my St. Paul calls it a tent. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. But do you yeah. think do you not think though uh, sorry, I'm being a bit skeptical here, yeah. but do you not think that we are then adding not I won't say the rest, but you know, we're using terms like, you know, she had left. Yeah. You know, she had left her body. But we we're still really, you know, kind of no further on knowing what is actually happening no. yes, afterwards. Afterwards, yeah. Okay, I, I want to move on now because that's a natural kind of uh, break in yeah. terms of moving on. I want to move on to what happens in the afterlife. You know, in a lot of religious traditions, uh, there's this uh, notion of a maybe takes place be between this place and that place, uh, wherever the other place is. Um, this notion of, of some kind of a judgment people talk about who, who go through a kind of, we'll come to it later, but a near-death near type of experience or post-death experience. They talk about their life being replayed in front of them. Uh, I think in, uh, I think it possibly in the Hindu or the Buddhist tradition, there's the, it's spoken of as the karma loka. It's in a lot of religious traditions. What, what do we make of that judgment where our life, we're called to account for our life in some kind of way? Can I take the word karma loka for a moment? Because that was a fairly new word to me. And, and of course, you'll imagine that I kind of looked that up. I'm sure that I've just shown my ignorance to everybody in the world. But uh, the way I understand it, it's, it's the time between lives. Yeah. Um, so there's a number of assumptions in there, aren't there? That, that we leave this life and we then have a little review and we then decide what the next life is going to be and we move on to the next one. Um, so am I right? Is that how people see what karma loka is? That is what karma loka okay. is, yeah. yeah. It related to karma, Yeah. obviously. Well, I, I guess so, on the loka rift. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I, that I said earlier that I think I believe in, and I do believe in, in that this is not the only life we have as a, as a, as a, as a consciousness, as a spirit, what, whatever we want to call that thing that is the essence of our life. I think there's more to it. And, and I do think that there's this time and, and I call it time, it's probably not, 
where we pass on from this mortal coil and we review and with some something else with some being or some other spirit or whatever it might be that we review this with and decide what to come back to do and we may i'm not sure we come back as the same person and relive it all again in some different way or we come back as something else and or why we even do that um i'm really a bit or confused as to what it, well yeah, if I'm, I'm, I'm convinced we do I mean, I mean, I'm convinced I'm we do, but why is, is trash that... your ideas? But yeah, I go mean, on, trash no, 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 not at all. But you know, we've kind of really moved kind of quite away from kind of you know factual stuff like you know the difference in the weight of the body when yeah. you know someone's died to something that is like very much belief, oh, very much, very so. much. Even the even you know the the karma loka or is it the bardo yeah. state? There's there's no evidence at all at this moment in time of these states actually ever e existing. You know, um, so. It is all kind of wrapped can up. Can we have hard evidence of this stuff, or do we? We, we live in a, you know, post enlightenment society where where we have to have evidence for everything. This kind of, or maybe there's different kinds of evidence. Well, as long as you don't have evidence for it, it's fine. Nobody's saying you have to have evidence. But then you've got to. It, it then belongs in the camp of just belief. It's not a fact. It's just belief. We would need someone dead to walk into this studio now, who we all knew was dead, and tell us all about it. I think the death communication is where the evidence will lie. And is there, is there um, evidence, that, that kind of evidence, that there is some form of judgment or life the, replay? The, from, from, from the, I mean, there's a long history of research into after-death communication that's been going on since the ninth, 19th century in the, in, mm. in the, in the UK. Um, obviously, you have the aspect of going to mediums and you know, after-death communication and all that type of stuff. But um, from my own personal experience, um, I have not come across any negative communication. Now, I'm not talking about negative. I'm talking yeah, about, about, no, you know, about yeah, heaven uh, and hell. Yeah. I, I personally think if, if, if you're going to pass over to another world, I still think your views and, and, and feelings will be the same on the other side. It's like I was once asked about mediumship. Now, so, the, my, my question, sorry yeah. to interrupt on, on this. Yeah. My question is about the, the replay of the life. Can I just come in there? So, in my personal opinion, in my experience, I've never come across any spirit, communication or energy that, that seems to suggest, to, that. To suggest yeah. that you are going to be negatively viewed. Well, no, I'm not saying negatively yeah. viewed. The, yeah. Can I, can I just... Sorry, yeah. I'm just um, th th there is, not, I won't say evidence, but there's, again, anecdotal... Uh, stories where people have said you know people who've survived car crashes mm -hmm. that for a moment you know while they were heading towards whatever it was a truck or whatever their life flashed uh, before them yeah. and the, the, the whole experience you know time seemed to, to dilate and what was seconds seemed to kind of last for you know kind of quite a few minutes but this idea that that they saw their li their life in in great detail kind of play in front of them at great speed. Um, now that is from people who have survived, you know, uh, obviously, and haven't actually died. So I suppose there, there is something, you know. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna break there, um, natural point to break. Um, join us after the break. We're talking about life after death and everything related to that here on Open Minds. Welcome back to Open Minds. Uh, we're talking about uh, life after death uh, with Ed and Mark and Donna. Um, we're talking about the afterlife here. You know, what is, what is life like in the afterlife, do you think? I mean, I, I'm uh, personally, you know, I'm horrified by the notion that I perhaps will be, you know, singing endless hymns and, you know, uh, you know, dancing with angels. I would like it to be a bit more interesting than that. I can't imagine doing that for eternity kind of thing. Um, what, you know, what, what, what do we think life is going to be like? Well, the only documentary evidence that we have as to what is life like after death is people who've experienced NDEs and obviously any spirit communication that's come after the event. And um, personally, I don't know. I, from, you know, we're told about heaven and hell and religious aspects and stuff but um for me personally i have no idea and that's one of the biggest mysteries to me and the communication that we've had has indicated that 
some people go on to do the same thing on the other side that they do over here. So if you're a scientist in life, there's researchers now who are regularly communicating on the other side with so-called scientists who've passed away. Is this stuff in the public domain? Yes, it is. It's all in the public domain. And how well received is it? I mean, it sounds, um, it sounds kind of incredulous to me. Well, some of it is incredulous, but when you actually physically hear those voices for the first time, and when you hear them alive coming through, um, you know, there's, you just... Just so you're talking about people, scientists on the other side, yeah. providing scientific information yes. for people on this side? Two researchers from this side. Well, I've heard this before. before. I brought a book with me today that actually wasn't a scientist talking no, to the scientist. It's a it, was, it was actually, I think he was just an ordinary yeah. guy. Mm -hmm. I think that's the one, yeah. Yeah. And, and what's that to me? Life in the world unseen. And, and the world unseen. It's just one of many books like this. And if you get a chance to read the sleeve notes afterwards, Keith, because the sleeve notes read like some kind of, again, a Hollywood mystery thing. The guy is talking like he's channeling someone else who's from the dead about what it's like. And this guy's describing the other world to this fellow who we're meant to believe. Uh, do I sound skeptical when I said that? I didn't mean no, to no, sound no. like no. I don't believe. No. But he's channeling information like this is a, and it's in real time. It's real conversation going on. You know, what's it like over there? We've got flowers just like there and it's all bright and sunny. And, and he's describing a world which is like this, only beautiful all the time. Complete. Complete yeah. and finished. He doesn't talk about anger or those things. He simply yeah. talks about the things he's taken with him that if he'd imagined this to be perfect, that's where he is. I mean, that does, and that's an that does sound um, not so dissimilar to what's described in the book of Revelation, actually. Mm. You know, when it talks about a new heaven, a new earth, it does describe mm -hmm. it as being a It does make you think, though, place. that the author of that could be just making it up from Revelation. Could be. That's the, that's the skeptic. That's the, that, yeah. But again, is it the desire? I mean, you know, in biblical times, you know, maybe life was hard and maybe life was ugly. And that well, not just in biblical times. In well, time. yeah, yeah, Depending lots of times. Everyone, everyone gets so, imagined. You know, so, I mean, you know, the slaves in, uh, in uh, America would, would, would sing about a time where it would, be, it would be better and they would be healed of their ailments and their sorrows. So maybe it's just a desire, again, that there will be... It doesn't matter how bad life is here, there is something, you know, after to look forward to where everything will be perfect. Okay, so th does, yeah. this guy, does this guy say that we meet our loved ones over there? Um, he doesn't say that in that book, as far as I can remember. Um, but other books will say that. Yeah. Um, my mum had a near-death experience during her cancer treatment, and she was critically ill. And she described her NDE uh, again as, as uh, travelling down a tunnel of light. And at the end of the tunnel were her relatives. Both of her parents were deceased and stuff. She couldn't see them. All she could see was the outline of a person and hear voices. And they told her that it wasn't her time and that she had to go back. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, a lot of these stories you're recounting, Donna, are actually from your own family. Yeah. Um, do you think this is unusual that you've had so many no. experiences? Do you think this is normal for families? No, I, th I, th I, think, um, I think the truth is my, my dad had a really serious road traffic accident and broke his neck. And um, it was very, it was public. It was same the accident that you referred to earlier. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, my dad had an accident and he described perfectly what Mark was talking about. He described time almost standing still. His, la his lorry came off a bridge and right, landed okay. on the road underneath. Um, and he described it perfectly like his life had stood still. And if he was here today, that's probably how he would describe it. And my mum's NDE, she only actually told us about her near-death experience um, two years ago. So I was totally unaware of that. I knew she had an interest in reincarnation, but she'd never divulged to us as a family that she'd had an NDE. So, you know, and when she did, I was dumbfounded that she'd kept it to herself for over 20 years. Okay, if if you know if there is an afterlife, and I think we kind of broadly are thinking that perhaps there is varying degrees of sort of acceptance of the notion, but if there is an afterlife, um, does that affect how we're living now? And that how does that what well, you know? Let me rephrase that. How does that affect our life now? And you know, you're obviously a, yeah. a professional in this area, if you like. Well, but um, are, have you been affected by this? I think I see the world very differently and I'm not as closed down as I used to be. And um, I think that I, my fear of death it has all but left me, obviously up until the day of my death, but my actual fear of death, because I used to be quite fearful of it, 
um, sort of seems to have dissipated. And I'm just very intrigued as to what, you know... What lies beyond? Yeah, I mean, there's been some really brilliant research on um, the hospice movement and um, doctors and, and nurses have declared their own um, experiences of working with uh, people who were dying and who have had some very ex extraordinary experiences of death, you know? So when you have professional people who are educated and well respected coming in and giving their own examples of this strange thing occurred and that strange thing occurred, it, it just makes you think there's something out there, there's something going on, there's something other than what we have here. Uh, does that make you live your life differently or better, do you think? I think it did. I think it, it, I think it has done something. I think the experiences that, that I've had have, yeah, I think they have changed my life to, uh, uh, I'm more interested in the things around me, the world around me. And, um, and kinder and more loving and... I think so, yeah. I, th I think more tolerance. I'm not entirely sure. I, I, I've got at least one very close friend who will be probably watching this and and will be thinking and and they 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 declare themselves atheist and, and and having no particular view and they think it's annihilation at the end and they'll be saying that doesn't change me from doing the right things mm -hmm. and being respectful and kind to people um, it doesn't mean that i'm going to run amok and just do what i like um, at other people's expense because there's no penalty to pay afterwards um, i just think I'll do what I think is good. So I, I don't, I'm not sure that, that believing in an afterlife or not changes necessarily the way you behave while you're here. I disagree there. I mean, historically, and even today, you've had people, saints, martyrs, who have you know, given up their life for the cause mm. because they know that there is something richer, something better to follow. Mm. And you know, without opening you know, too much, bigger kind of worms, there are people today in our midst who are martyring themselves again for the because cause the with, a, with a promise. There is a promise that they will be rewarded in an afterlife. So that is definitely, you know, kind of, I think, So it can affect us positively and negatively. Well, yeah, I, I think I would agree with what you said, but I'm not sure that that counters what I've just said. I was trying to say that, that it doesn't, you don't need to believe there's something better afterwards to lead a, de a decent life now. Um, and that's what I was trying to yeah, argue. I, I'm the same person as I've always been, but it's not just a belief, it's an experience, it's personal experiences that initiated that interest. Mm. And then, you know, I'm still not 100% sure about where we go or what mm. we do, you know, I haven't been on the other side, so I wouldn't know, but it's, it hasn't changed me as a person. I think it's, it's I'm more tolerant than I used to be because there were times when I would completely block, put the walls down if anyone wanted to discuss mm. something that I didn't believe in. And now I realise that discussions like this as well, uh, even if I don't agree 100% with Ed or Mark, I will come away from this situation having learned something and can go out and explore something for myself. I just thought, we've got, I've got a couple of minutes really, but this is kind of a statement and, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, another episode really but uh, an extreme kind of atheist view would be kind of like a Nietzschean nihilistic kind of view which actually has that view as a, as a kind of philosophy has led to some terrible uh, acts of, uh, of violence I mean it could be argued that you know Hitler was uh, influenced by that and um, the view that actually there is there's no responsibility uh, in the less life because we're just, just we're just gonna end and Get what, you can get. get what you can get but also as well as I said before there are people who have a belief that there is something afterwards and <laughs> their, equ their, their behavior is equally as bad you know uh, borne out by their beliefs and the reward that they will get for being a martyr so mm. and then there's the fact as well the Bible is a fascinating book because a lot of the phenomena that are recorded in the Bible would today, if those things happened, be classed as paranormal? Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that I've read in the Bible, and a lot of I mean, I've still got well, a paranormal is just a word. Isn't yeah, it? of course, it's just something that we can't explain that's supposedly extraordinary. But who knows? It, we may be the extraordinary, and paranormal may be the normal. 
you know, but when you do read certain parts of the Bible and you read, let's talk about voices in the wilderness. Today, we would class that as direct voice communication. A voice yeah, that comes out of yeah. nowhere. You know, well, I had an interesting conversation with my daughters. We're going to stop us now. Yeah. We're going to the break again. When we come back, um, what I want to pick up on really is the near-death experiences. I know yeah. we've mentioned them. But after the break, join us after the break. We're going to talk about near-death experiences on Open Minds. Welcome back to Open Minds. We're discussing life after death here in the studio. Um, I want to pick up on the near-death experiences for this last section. Uh, we've, we've mentioned them. Um, you know, what are they? I mean, people talk about, uh, you know, people who die, uh, well, have a near-death experience in hospital. Sometimes they talk about being in the corner of the room, looking down on their body. People go further. They talk about seeing a white light. Um, you know, it's just lots of different accounts aren't there of of, of near death or post death people literally die come back to life and come back with messages you know what's going what's going on there yeah. donna um well having read the work of dr elizabeth kubler ross she was a, a a swiss doctor i think she was swiss and she did a lot of research she created the hospice movement and um her research and there was also some other research from doctors in new york very famous research on near death so she just stop me there yeah. she was a person of faith then if she if she was involved with the hospice movement um no she created the hospice movement yeah. she was a scientist and a doctor and basically she she's wrote multiple books on um, death and dying yeah. the grief process yeah. and all yeah, that yeah. she's very famous but she actually indicated in some of her later work that she'd come across like um people who were near to death and they would come across them physically in spirit form in another part of the hospital and, and stuff like this. She documented it so that they weren't actually physically dead, but somehow a projection of them. Like one lady, she talks about meeting someone who had physically died in the lift. So, and she's a, you know, a woman of great education, great intelligence, and very well respected. And then there's a research in New York where there was a group of doctors who were researching near death. And basically what they did was planted objects throughout the hospital and on different floors, different levels of the hospital. Like there was a tennis shoe on the fifth window on the left-hand side of the building. It's all been documented and it's all out there in the general public. And people who'd had near-death experiences had joined the, the research and, and some of them had said, oh yeah, um, when I was floating through the walls of the building, one guy described seeing a tennis shoe hanging off the... I'm, I'm not do you know the sure, yeah, but I'm not too sure if that's been discredited. Um, I don't think it has. Yeah, it has. I, th I think so. Papers, wasn't it? No, no, no. I don't quite understand that. What's the significance the, the, of the well, well, the whole like this is this is not Mark. near death. This is more to do with astral projection, which um, where people are able to project their consciousness out of their body, and this is the experiment where objects were placed. At, you know, various know different points. Similar, that's similar with astral projection. This yeah. was actually, from what I've read, was actually yeah. research done by doctors in New York who had had so many, I think the guy's written a book, he'd had so many people talking about near-death experiences and floating outside the hospital windows and stuff that it was actually done as a research paper as far as I, I know what you're talking about, the astral projection stuff. Well, no, what I was gonna, what I was gonna go on to say was is that um, th this story about seeing the tennis yeah. shoe on the window, the um, candidate, yeah. Uh, who was being studied was filmed at some point getting out of the bed and looking out of out, the, out of the window or at, at this particular object, then getting back to, back in the bed again. So yeah. it kind of totally scotched this oh, whole right, kind okay. of research. I'm not saying, I'm just yeah. saying that particular thing. Yeah. And I think it was, uh, I think it was Anthony Peake who wrote the "Is a Life uh, After, After Death, Death" book, yeah. uh, who's done a lot of research into near-death experiences. When he kind of delved a little bit deeper some of this stuff had been like kind of... Hijacked, you mean? Not hijacked, no, it had been like kind of um, uncovered to be not true or not as accurate or as... not as true. Not as true as, you know, was being initially reported. Okay, okay, let's yeah. go back to the... the, the yeah, so there's near-death experiences and then there's people who, who actually do die. I mean, people mm. die and come back to life medically. Yeah. Mm. Now, some of those people record quite... It's often quite similar things. So going yeah. down a tunnel, mm. Uh, there's a white light at the end, meeting somebody, um, at, the meeting end, somebody uh, at the end. Being or a relative uh, yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, what, what do we have to say about that? Well, Ed, 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 
um, I don't have any personal experiences of those things, I'm pleased to say. Um, but I do have a close relative. I won't say who it is, but she knows who it is. And um, she told me that another close relative appeared to her when she was on a trolley being wheeled into the emergency operating theatre. She was really close to death, um, a, a crisis in, in, in something that was uh, vital systems was, was giving up. And she was being wheeled furiously into the, into the operating theatre. Um, and she was, at the time, she was pregnant, very close to delivery. And, and that was part of her problem too. And, and, and she said that um, another close relative who'd passed on some years before hovered over the trolley while she was being wheeled. And this, this entity, this relative, was beckoning to her. They were very close. And she remembers saying out loud, <laughs> bleep, bleep, bleep off you. I'm not going. I've got a baby. <laughs> and this person bleeped off. Yep. And she had the baby and she's still here today. And, and was that, was that a, and So that wasn't a, person, a comforting thing then? No, it? this is a person who was extremely willful and extremely down to earth, this individual. The job that she does is extremely important that she is. Um, but she recalls that. Like it well, was that, that, real. That, again, that, I mean, that's, so, that's somebody. It could be. Yeah. That's it somebody from be. the other side coming. But I'm talking yeah. about these exp these experiences. You know what I mean. You, you, might, uh, yeah. you know, what do you make of the, the similarities between these these post death? I, th I think there's been, there's been a lot of research into the physiology of the brain during the, at the point of death and the chemical structure and the chemicals produced at the point of death, um, and so that's very interesting. Um, a lot of top scientists tend to say uh, that the chemicals that are produced at the point of death take us on a journey sort of like a you know like a, a hallucinogenic type journey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah, type yeah. of journey <clears throat> and that's very interesting research to 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 read but then there's also there's a book being published i think it was last year by a neuroscientist one of america's most famous and he had a near-death experience and the first part of his near-death experience was not very pleasant at all mm. and it's a really interesting book um, because it differs somewhat to and he believes it was his level of understanding of the process of death and his faith and religious background that had an impact on his experience of near death so his own beliefs interfered somewhat in his process so we can do it's like an experiment really we bring our own conditioning to some it, of to, our own yeah. conditioning yeah. to it yeah. but um i find those documented reports and his book i forget his name but it's a brilliant book and um, it's caused a lot of controversy because he started to investigate what is the dying pro what part of the dying process but there are, he's now said also that he believes it's not just a physiological process he believes it's a spiritual process as well there was something else externally going on there is i mean the, the, there is talk uh scientists have said that the the body does produce mm -hmm. certain chemicals and one of those chemicals that's been banded about is dimethyltryptamine yeah and when this which is something the body does produce naturally but it's said in large amounts at the point of death I don't know how true this is, but then there's other people who've actually been injected with this substance. Uh, I think uh, there's in a, a book clinical in a clinical setting, setting yeah. yes, and they themselves have had similar experiences where they have found themselves again outside their physical body. Mm -hmm. So whether or not this this chemical, this dimethyltryptamine, is something to do with that whole process and the experience of feeling you are leaving your body, I'm not too sure. Well, I mean, the white light experience is also uh, people who practice, you know, serious meditation, uh, uh, fasting um, in, in across religious traditions. We'll yeah. talk about that. Almost in some traditions, it's the goal is to, to, is to get to, to the cross uh, to cross over. Yeah. 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 And that's what's interesting about part of some of the research to do with the dying process and about drug therapies and stuff like that. And, um, but it is interesting that, but not all NDEs follow the same pattern. Some are very, very graphic and some are very, very different. And 
and a lot of people have documented their own and of course there's the idea of reincarnation <coughs> uh, as well gets thrown into into the mix yeah we might talk about that in the next kind of yeah. session yeah. in but fact the author of the book you just described he he has a book on nde as well yeah. um mm. as, as another one of his publications and and i think it's probably worth a good a good read because mm. it does deal much more with the scientific side yeah. of nde and and i'm not entirely sure that he has any conclusions of his own but it presents lots of data yeah. for us to make our own judgments mm. there is i mean the one thing i think that would be an interesting study would be to capture this information, these stories of near-death experiences over the whole world and look at the common traits uh, in these stories, that, you know, the, the fact that people do feel they're going down a tunnel, that they are seeing a light. I'm going to have to stop you there, Mark. Thank you guys for coming on today. Uh, it's been a great show. Um, look forward to seeing you next time, Donna. Look forward to seeing you on another programme. Um, and to our audience at home, uh, join us for the next episode of Open Minds. Thank you.